the book is about gratitude. So yes. like you, you better knock this one out of the park. This is a big one. Okay. So what like gratitude. when you when you hear the term gratitude, like what does that even mean? I feel like a lot of pressure here, but I, and I will say that it is a ton of pressure, but I will say um you know, I I write books not because I have all the answers, but because I want answers. Mm -hmm. And so it was really so fun for me to take this deep dive on what is gratitude? Why should we be practicing it? How is it going to impact um, our learning communities? And so what I, what I kind of came to understand is it's like this recognizing and appreciating something in your life mm -hmm. and then what my deep dive kind of revealed, and I looked at the science and the experts and Dr. Robert Emmons talks about like, yes, it's that, but it's also acknowledging that the external and a lot of times it's people are kind of what bring that positive to us. So like something good mm -hmm. has happened and yes, sometimes it is ourselves, but a lot of times it's other people helping right. us in big or small ways. And so to me, that was like the really interesting thing because Learning is very social. Our learning communities are connected. It's all about relationships, right? Yep. And so that was really something I wanted to dive deeper into. And, and I think, and this is, this is, we were kind of talking about this when the book was going on. Cause I think a lot of times people here are like, oh, gratitude is like fluff stuff, right? And like, right. I'm just calling what it is, right? Sure. Yeah. And one of the conversations that we said is like, hey, you have to show how this actually improves learning. It's not like just a, it's just not just like, oh, I'm like really into gratitude and I think it's important. It's like, hey, this is actually beneficial to, to kids learning. And now that now this is not one of the questions, but like, can you give us an example of something that you found that was like, hey, this is actually, this is why it's beneficial to learning in schools? Yeah. So, gosh, there's a few things. I'm going to try and articulate. Only do one because this is a teaser. Fine. Okay, fine. You got to um, get the book to get all the other parts. A lot of pressure. Um, I, I would even just say looking at the neuroscience of mm. when you're experiencing gratitude and that serotonin and dopamine that's released, like, and, and I know Sean Aker talks about this, like mm. that actually floods the brain and turns on like all the learning centers. I hear what you're saying. People are going to think gratitude and they're going to think fluff, but I'm really trying right. to bring the science and the heart into this. I want I want people to know both. Like, yes, it's it's not all um, you know, and Mandy Frey, like she's gonna be on the Evolving with Gratitude podcast. And she's like, <laughs> Yes, yes, for Mandy. Mandy's a multiple time uh, guest on the podcast here. Too. Of course, she's awesome. And you know, she says something to the effect of, you know, it's not like all you know, rainbows and chasing bunnies in a field. Like it's mm. apparently Although that would be fun. That would be fun. Mm -hmm. um, but it's really much deeper than that. I think a lot of times when we think, you know, about the risks that we take, we think about what can we lose from this? If we walk away from this opportunity, if we walk away from this thing, what are we going to lose from this? But I don't think we think enough. And I, I certainly wasn't. We don't think about what could I gain? If I walk away from this, what could I act? What, how could this make my life better? And what could I gain from this? And I think a lot of times we talk about regret, we talk about things that we did, but if you look back on your life and you think about opportunities that you didn't take advantage of, I, I guarantee you'd find a lot of regret there. And I would love to say, I jump on every opportunity. I talk to every person that I wanted to talk to, you know, but I've done it a lot. I've, I've jumped on opportunities. I, I, I've learned over the years that it's always great to ask a question, even when it's most likely you're going to, get a no just to kind of put yourself out there and share those ideas because you just never know what possibly good thing could happen so as you're kind of as i'm kind of talking through this and sharing i think about some of the risks that i was willing to take to move away from things that not weren't not necessarily making me miserable but weren't making me happy that weren't bringing joy to my life each day and I don't necessarily think that every job in the world should like every kid should follow their passion I think that when we talk about career I think you know some people a job is what they make money with and that's it and everything else in their life is what brings them joy and and that's awesome if that if that's what gets them up in the day that's great I love that but I, I know there's some times that I think back on when I think back on me taking that risk 
that I, I didn't know if I'd ever be in education. I just knew that if I stayed, I would hate it. I would hate what I was doing. And so I took that risk. And recently, I was speaking at a conference. And I, I'm going to tell you, getting up on stage and doing a keynote, I love it. I, I honestly remember watching. Um, I remember watching somebody do it when I was, you know, a teacher and uh, speaking. I'm like, I'd like to do that one day, <clears throat> but never really thought about it. Like, I just like that. That looks cool. And that was it. It was basically all that happened out of that thought. And I remember being in that keynote and doing this, and I almost felt like I had this out of body experience. And I just kind of looked and I, I just kind of looked. I'm like, you're crushing this. This is like so good. You are just doing such a good job. I just felt like everything, my timing was really good. Um, the audience was really excited about what I was sharing. I could just feel the energy. And it was like I was getting giving energy to the audience. The audience was giving energy back to me. And for me, there was just no better feeling than in that moment to feel I am I am like doing something that I am truly meant to do. I just feel it. I just feel this emotion right now. And there are so many things that I did, and I, I still do, to get to that point, the way that I go and study speakers, um, the way that I, you know, I watch, like, I still watch videos of, like, you know, TED Talks and, you know, Jim Valvano. I watch Jim Valvano's videos a million times. I, I just love the way he delivers things. Because I don't see it as just something I do. I see it as an art form. And I, I want to just do just make that art as meaningful as possible. Um, the connections I made, the stuff that I, you know, read, the way that I write about stuff that I eventually talk about, and the reason I, I write about it is so I can kind of like dive through it in my mind. The reason I do some of these podcasts is so I can kind of dig into ideas and I can just kind of like work through my ideas so that when I, they get to a place where I'm presenting them on a stage, they're just really refined and and thought out. So there are a million things that I can point to that I do to have got to that point where I feel this is just something I love doing. This is just where I'm meant to be. And I'll tell you, there is just literally no better feeling than that. That and, and not only that, this is where I'm meant to be, but I'm I'm good at this. Like I'm really good at this and I love it. And I'm proud of that. And I know that sometimes, you know, some of you might be, oh, he's just bragging. Now. Yeah, I am bragging. I, I've worked really hard to do this. And I think that if, you, if you're offended that I'm proud of something, then are you offended when kids are proud of something they do? We encourage kids to, you know, be proud of when they, they know they've done something right. I don't think I'm better than anyone or anything like that. What I do think is I found something that I love that I just feel I'm, I'm really good at. When I first acquired the school, um, I met with the teachers like the first day. And so I was like, what do you want me to know about Plummer? Like, what should I know about it? And so it was often repeated from the teachers that we're the best kept secret in Cedar Hill. People don't really know about us. The school's kind of tucked off. It was kind of like the school that was over there. Um, people weren't really at the bit to attend. Um, it was just kind of like just there. And so after meeting the teachers and hearing their passion and their love for the school, it was my sole mission that everything I wanted to do was to build, encourage, and uplift the teachers, the community, and the students at that school. And so my non-negotiable for being a principal was culture and climate and having an expectation of learning. Um, we had low test scores at the time. We had a high social economic uh, population. And so I came in strong. And to be honest with you, George, there were a lot of people. I was young at the time. I was, I think, 32 as a principal. And a lot of teachers there had literally been there like 30 years, like mm -hmm. for real. And so here I am. I'm new. I'm fresh. I'm young. I'm exciting. And I was kind of hit with resistance at first, like, why are we doing these things? Why, why is this important for us to celebrate and to engage and to take the time to have conversations and really get to know our kids and our families? Um, but it was a non-negotiable for me and I was relentless at it. And so everything that we did on the campus, I would tell the staff, we're creating experiences. Mm. 
It would create every time someone steps a foot on this campus, every time you have a conversation with the teacher, every time a kid walks in your door, you are creating an experience. And what experience are we going to create on this campus? Positive culture and climate was is was the standard. And so, for example, let me give you an example. Most times when it's like meet the teacher, you just go to the school, you get a slip of paper, you show them mm -hmm. who your teacher is, and that's it. No, experiences. And so we did it like every year we had a theme. So like one year we did like it was a circus. And so we, we actually made like a ticket booth. We had like red carpet. We had a popcorn machine. We had lady outside doing bubbles. We hired a DJ. Um, you went to the ticket booth to get your ticket to find out who your teacher was. And then the clowns took you down the hallway to, to, to the room. We decorated like we made people when they walked in that building feel like, wow. And when you do that, you're setting that tone that number one, they can care enough about me to create an environment to make me feel welcome. Um, and then mm. you will see kids' eyes light up. We were in a low socioeconomic school. My kids didn't have those experiences that the kids across town had. So they may not have been able to go to the circus. They might not have been able to go to a concert or to have different people come into the campus. And so I didn't let that be an excuse. I brought those experiences to my kids and to my family and to my community. And I'm so very proud of that. And so everything we did, so, for example, I, Deion Sanders came to our school to talk to our yeah. dad. Let me tell you, you want, let me tell you this story. So we had all pro, so my, again, I was building culture and climate and I, I, I knew that there was a lack of fathers and dads in our schools and the presence of our students. So I wanted to, to cultivate that. I wanted to generate getting father figures, getting dads involved in the school. And so we had an all dads, all pro dads program. And so I'm like, oh, I really want to go big. I really want someone who's credible, who can speak to the dads. So this is when I first got on Twitter. I was not who I am now on Twitter. I was like, like nobody <laughs> and i'm still a nobody i'm dying are you you i'm like let i'm dying you. right now i'm dying you. i well, know what's coming I, i'm dying well let me tell you so i literally so dion at the time lived in cedar hill which is where yeah. our district is and so i knew he lived there and so i got on twitter and one day i tweeted <laughs> him and i was like hey dion I was like, I'm a principal in Cedar Hill. I need you to come to my school August, no, October is like October 29th for All Pro Dads Day. Well, of course, I didn't hear anything. It's Deion Sanders, right? <laughs> so the next day I get on Twitter. Hey, Dion, I know that you saw my tweet yesterday. <laughs> you didn't say anything, but I need you to come October 29th for All Pro Dads Day. George, I lied to you. <laughs> and Twitter's open, so you can go back and look years ago. I tweeted that man every single day every day <laughs> every day for over a month i had kids get on there hey I love it. Come, come talk to my dad about being a dad or what like i had teachers get on there every day i would wear like a jersey and be like what's up like <laughs> so um and, and so i never forget one day i was uh my my girlfriend my best friend she got married and i was in jackson mississippi over the weekend and so i was at her wedding reception and i pulled out my phone to tweet him because he didn't respond <laughs> for like the 45th day and i see that i had a message from him in my inbox and i was like oh my god oh my god then i got nervous because i was like he's probably gonna like <laughs> A like cease and assist, like stop, right. tweeting, like leave me alone, lady. Like, and so he um, he responded and he said, um, contact my agent at blah 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 blah. And so I was like, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god. He knows I, like he knows that I exist. And so that that uh, following week when we got back, so I called the um, I called the agent or whatever, and somehow he was on the phone or in the car with them. And so I was like. The first thing I was like, Dion, I don't have any money. I can't pay you. I know that you're worth everything. I said, but I need you to come to my campus. The kids deserve it. The dads need to hear from you. Like, please, like with everything in me, just come to our campus. Our, you know, our community needs you. He was like, girl, uh, it's October. You know, it's football season. I can't come. <laughs> you know, he's like, do you not know who I am? I'm like, yes, I know who you are. I'll change the date. Whatever date you want it to be it done, I'll change it. Just come. And so we were literally on the phone, literally. And my secretary buzzed in and she was like, um, Mr. <laughs> here. And I was like, shut up. Oh my God. And so he was 
happened to be in the neighborhood. So he rolled, he rolled up and he came to the school and he was there. And I was just in shock. <laughs> I was like, this is amazing. Deion Sanders is literally sitting here. So the power of social media, um, but it, I didn't even know I was going to talk about that, but just, just the experiences, mm -hmm. how it was so important to me. I was relentless about bringing my kids the best and, 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 and highlighting it and marketing. I went to Twitter. So we had a superintendent and he, came years ago and he was like you guys have to get on twitter and my first thought was i'm not getting on twitter i already have facebook i already have instagram and i don't have time for another platform <laughs> but i'm also that person like if you give me a challenge i want to exceed it so right. when he said that you know we have to get on twitter cool i'm all in let's go so i i um got on twitter i told my teachers and they of course at first weren't receptive to it so i said hey you have to tweet at least once a week mm -hmm. i mean that's not that hard at least once a week show the great things that are happening in your classroom you're doing the work anyway you're engaging you guys are phenomenal teachers when you're doing a small lesson or you're doing a, a, a presentation or the kids are engaged take a picture put it on social and so I started promoting everything, every day, all the time, the great things that were happening on our campus. George, when I tell you, after four years of being at that campus, the culture and climate had completely changed. We went from the lowest performing district uh, school in the district to having distinctions, to performing mm -hmm. at the highest level possible. We had the highest waiting list for students that want to enroll That's in our amazing. campus. I mean, we were like the campus. People wanted to go to Plummer. And so, you know, I'm just so thankful that social media was a, was a there so that the, that I could show what was happening. I could share that with our parents and our community. And I could highlight the great things that were happening um, on our campuses and how amazing the teachers were. And that we created a culture in a school where kids felt important. They felt valued. Mm -hmm. And when you do that, when you set the tone that when you walk in this building that you're loved and you're valued, think about what that does for your right. ability to learn. You take those barriers and those guards down where students feel like I can be vulnerable. I right. can say to the teacher that I don't understand. I know that my classmate isn't going to ridicule or bully me because we didn't tolerate that. Um, teachers felt free to think outside of the box and create lessons that you know, not just textbook. Right. I the teachers, I want you to go outside and hang from the tree, or I want to see you like, you know, down the hallway with chalk painting on the walls or whatever, because it just matters. There's a, a Dimitri Martin uh, image that I've used. I love Dimitri Martin. I, yeah. And it's like, it, it was a, is he, I think he was like a, he was just, is one of it is a book he had written. And there's, he does a lot of like drawings and, right. and stuff like that. And he talked about what's, what success looks like or what people think success looks like and what it actually looks like. So he has the first is just a straight line going right. forward. And the other one's like up and down. And I've used that image. Always give credit to Dimitri Martin. Right. And I, I do a little revamp of it. And I just change the word success with learning and really kind of what does learning look like? And you, you mentioned this, this part too. And we talked about this before the podcast, the, the misconception a lot of times is that it's either product or process. Mm. But it's actually both. And I think that that's really uh, powerful. And there is a, uh, I saw John Medina uh, speak at ISTE uh, and he's the author of Brain Rules. And he said something that has always stuck out to me. He said, it was something along the lines of like, content or, or creation without content is the equivalent of playing the air guitar. You might know the motions, but you don't know how to actually play. And it's like, it's kind of that, wow. build, right? So I, th I think that was like a, a really powerful connection because a lot of times, you know, and that's helped me because I I'll work, especially at the high school level where, you know, classroom, let's be honest, classes are a lot more content heavy. People are like, well, we got to teach this content. I'm like, yeah, I'm not saying don't teach the content, but what, right. are, what are people actually doing with it? Right. And right. I think that that's kind of like the crux of the innovator's mindset is like, it's going beyond the, the notion of information, but what do you do with that information? That's really powerful. So like when you're, when you're talking about this, and I, I actually kind of want to focus on the process of writing the book. Right. right. So like, when you think about that, like when you're, when, when you have like, what, what's that big question that you're like struggling with as you are thinking about like, how do I, how do I make this happen? How do I make this book? Cause I, I think a lot of people would be interested in that. I really just want to 
try to organize and make sense of everything that I've learned so far in my educational career and to be able to, um, you know, find themes and patterns and really try to curate different information, um, strategies, tools, everything that I've ever learned and really try to make sense of it, chew on it for a little bit and try to, you know, put something out there that I can learn from myself and hopefully others will be able to learn from as well and just give them some different touch points to be able to reference and try out for themselves to see if it works. Um, so I have all these ideas that are in my brain and I'm just really just trying to make sense of it and hopefully I'll be able to, um, organize it in my own brain and make it make sense to other people as well. So, so here's, here's, and I, this is what I want to talk about this. Cause like, I, I think we, like, you know, I've written a few books and I'm kind right. of like listening to you. I'm like, okay, so what did I do? Cause I had the same issue, right? Like I had a ton of ideas. And what I, what I first started doing is I actually, I know this is going to seem like really simple. I just made a Google doc. And I'm like, what are the biggest, most important things I want to share in this book? Right? Mm. Like maybe it's a really important idea Maybe it's important, uh, st like a really powerful story, things like that. So I just made a Google Doc and I wrote those things out, right? I just wrote, you know, kind of was just like a general thing. But as I started like putting the chapters together, uh, I would actually like say like, here's what I want to talk about. And then I would actually go look at that main Google Doc and say, where, what, which one of these things fits here, right? Mm. Like which one fits in this this topic, this this idea of what I'm, I'm sharing in the strategy. And I would actually, um, I would actually have... Uh, like a, a, a separate Google Doc for each chapter. And I would just write notes. I would just write notes here and there. And then eventually I would actually just start writing and like, look, did I address this? I do this. And then once I like, like put them in a chapter, then I would actually go back to the original Google Doc. And then I would just do like strike through text to make sure that, and then I would like say like, hey, use this in chapter four, use this in chapter five. You talk about, um, we, we talked about this a little bit before in another podcast about, uh, your new book, Rogue Leader, and you talk about professional development. And so, like, how do you t tell us a little bit about your book first before we kind of get into the professional development aspect of it? Yeah. So, uh, Rogue Leader is my newest book. It is a follow up uh, to my first book, The Four O'Clock Faculty, about professional development. Um, and it really starts with the premise that uh, professional development, the, the term professional development in mm -hmm. education, is a dirty word. Right. And how do we get away from that? How do we build systems that will help teachers um, and, and work with and for teachers rather than PD being done to teachers? And I think that's the, the biggest difficulty is often, you know, we're, we're pushing PD at someone mm -hmm. um, as if, you know, here's the solution. Do this PD and then everything will be fine. Right. And uh, that's not really how professional growth or professional learning works. And so um, Rogue Leader is all about you know, taking some of that professional responsibility on yourself, um, but also inspiring others to kind of take on that professional responsibility and that professional learning. So when, when is there ever an op or a time where professional development has to be done to teachers, right? Like when, like, Hey, we want this, we want, uh, we want empowerment. We want, you know, uh, we want your voice at the table, but sometimes you just got to do it. Right. Like, w like when, when is that, when does that make sense to do? Yeah, I, I think there's absolutely a time where something does have to be pushed out. Right. Um, but again, going back to what I said before, it's about that support, right? So, mm. you know, this is something that we want all teachers to learn how to do. Uh, right. Then we definitely need to support teachers in how to do it. So whether it's a, a new program that's being implemented, whether it's a, a new strategy or initiative, um, making sure that you're, you know, providing coaches or um, you know, multiple professional development sessions, right. um, you know, kind of what I talk about in the book is, is getting away from the one and done, you know, the, the buzzword du jour where, you know, mm -hmm. all of a sudden we have a great new PD, we roll it out once and teachers should be good. Uh, whereas, you know, con continuous PD is, is often the way to go where teachers have something constantly and consistently that is helping them grow. The, 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 as someone who, you know, is contracted to do work, you know, professional learning opportunities with staff. I can really tell, and I, I'm sure you've seen this. I can tell the difference between someone bringing me in because they know my work and it aligns with the stuff that they're doing and they see it as like a, like a bridge. It's something that's going to help them grow in that, in the work that's either happening or about to happen long-term versus who's bringing me in to fill a day because they don't know what else to do. Do you, know, do you know what I mean? Like, have you seen that before? 
Yeah, absolutely. And uh, it's funny because I wrote about that in the book is, you know, like I, I've been the I've been the, the the buzzword guy coming in for one day. And, right. um, you know, like you said, you can very easily tell it's it's when people oh. are sitting, you know, 30 rows from you in the back of the auditorium and, and what, you know, no parts of what you're what yeah. you're saying, because no one has ever, you know, given your message before in uh, in any type of PD. So I think it is important to. Um, like I said, make it consistent, make it continuous, yeah. uh, really, really push a message um, and uh, live the message. That's the important piece. If you're trying to help people grow, uh, you have to you have to live that message. <laughs>